the computer. Okay, so there are a couple of assembly language projects I would like to show you. And that goes here, 126. And we're going to be a lot more of them, but I wrote a couple here. One, some in Jasmine and some in MASM, and here's Ida Pro. So Jasmine is the easiest way to do this, and you can run this on any machine that runs um, Java, but it works inside this virtual machine we're using, so you might as well just put it there. So Jasmine is here, and there we are. She so hit new file, and now you have a simple simulator of the assembly. Here is the registers, EAX, EBX, ECX. This is simulating a 32-bit x86 machine on, in this case, a 32-bit uh, OS, but it can run 64-bit OS also. So you put instructions here, like I can put um, a move EAX1. And it changes color. So if you make something wrong here, like um, there, the instruction turns red, telling you there's no parameter. And if I just prove EA1, it's going to be upset, although that might actually be valid because it's 32-bit instruction. Hey, movie X1, when you get it right, it turns to a happy color like green. It shows you instructions down here explaining to you what it does and showing you its move, destination, comma, source. So this will put one in the AX. Then I can put another one like move uh, EBX2, and you can use uppercase or lowercase in this. It doesn't matter. I spelled move wrong, so it turned red. So if I make it M, it looks good again. All right, so it has not executed any of these instructions. The highlighted green is the instruction pointer, and you can see it here. EIP is zero. It points to the zeroth instruction. Now, in a real processor, these instructions are in memory over here, but in Jasmine, it has a separate block of instructions that are separate than this, which is not exactly accurate, but that's how it works. So now I can run this code here. This will run it to the end. So it executes all those instructions and stops. So it puts a 1 in EAX and a 2 in EBX. And then there's a couple of blank lines here. So I can reset it here. That sets it back to its original state. I can do one instruction at a time with this one. So this will move EAX1. And then the next one will move EBX2. So you can run instructions. Now I can do things like push EAX and push EBX. I have to spell push correctly, though. Okay, so now if I execute one push, then nothing changes here or here. What happens is it puts it on the stack, and the stack is at the bottom here. So I think I'll make my window a little smaller. Okay, so I can reach the scroll bar. All right, and now I can get down. The stack is at the bottom here, so I pushed a one at the bottom of the stack. So the green highlights the stack frame. And I put a 1 in, which is the contents of EAX. And even though it shows 1 here, it's a 32-bit word of 1. So it has a whole bunch of zeros and then a 1. Now, if I push the next one, it puts a 2 here. So now the stack contains two 32-bit words. And you can see that here. EBP is 4096. ESP is 4088. And those are in base 10. This is in hexadecimal. I could put them both in decimal. And... Uh, Let's see, no descending, there. They're not in decimal, 4092, 4088. You can put them that way, you can put them both in hex, however you like. So that's how that works. Now I could increment EAX and increment EAX and then push EAX. So you can do this stuff. So if EAX is currently one, if I increment it, it's two, increment it again, it's three. Then I push it. Now the stack has the stack frame has three words, and that's how many have turned green. The green highlight shows you the current stack frame. Now, if I pop stuff off the stack, I can pop ECX and pop EDX. All right. So when I pop ECX, it puts a three here, and the stack frame gets smaller because ESP has gone up to 4088. So now this three here is no longer used. It remains on the stack as data remnants. And this is something to be aware of. Your SSDs, your hard drive, and your memory have leftover data in them that you're not using anymore. And that could be a problem. The target RAM scrapers stole credit card numbers out of RAM on the payment machines for this reason. There are data types that are ephemeral that automatically erase when you quit using them. Microsoft put them in Visual Studio in 2004, but unfortunately, a lot of developers have not learned to use them. 
So they write code that leaves stuff in RAM that you're not using anymore, like passwords and stuff, and it's a shame. It really should be cleaning it off. But if you don't use a special variable type or deliberately erase it, the data that you used to have is just sitting in RAM, and there are various exploits that refer to it. Anyway, so now if I pop EDX, it'll put a two in EDX, and now the stack is back down to just one word, being green again. I've, uh, all right, so that's, that's some simple assembly. And um, all right, that's move and push and pop. And so that's using the stack and so on. All right, and so uh, that's the game here. So now you can, here's code that will reverse a sequence. Uh, one great thing about Jasmine is it's just like Notepad. You can just copy and paste code in. So I can just delete this stuff and paste in that stuff and run it. So I can reset it all. Now, so I'm going to just put one, two, three, and four in the registers. So let's do that. One, two, three, and four. Then it's going to put them on the stack. Push, 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 push. So those four things are on the stack. Then it's going to pop them into A, B, C, D. And so they're going to come in in reverse order because the stack is last in, first out. That's all that does. But anyway, that's, um, you can do that sort of thing. And there are a couple challenges here where you have to figure things out. Here's the code that makes a secret message. It prints out a message. By the way, there's a console in Jasmine. The first few bytes at the memory region starting with zero can be seen in the console. I just found this by accident one day. So if I notice there's nothing visible in the console, but if I take this stuff, I'm just going to delete this old stuff. Let's uh, move into EAX. Uh, 40, 0x41, and then move into location 0, yeah, let's see what that does. All right, looks like I put it there, there, there's my program. This puts a 41 in EAX, this puts that in byte 0, way up here at the start. So let's see what that does. That will reset. Move, okay, and move there, it puts an A on the screen. So the first low numbered bytes actually can be viewed in ASCII there, so you can fit readable messages in Jasmine. I thought I saw a chat message, but maybe it was just, yeah, okay, it was just my mouse moving around. Anyway, so I made a, a little puzzle here where this thing prints out a message and then erases it with X's. So you have to run the code and stop it before it finishes to get the secret message. And here's another one where you have to get it to print the message here. So there's a couple little puzzles to solve, and that gives you raw assembly code practice. Now, you can now start writing real code on Windows. I found this thing called NASM32. This thing is really old. In my other class, we're actually using Visual Studio. There's a command line version of Visual Studio, which is even cooler. But before I learned how to do that, I got this NASM32 thing. This is a really old command line based assembler for Windows. It looked, you can tell this is all from like the MS DOS or Windows 95 days sort of thinking. But anyway, it installs this junk, takes several minutes to go on, and now you can write assembly code. So this is hello world in assembly. The semicolons are comments. This tells you it's 486 code, which gives you a clue how old this product is. Then you have um, include some files that it needs to do it, include some libraries it needs. And here's the only part that matters, print, hello world, which is 13 bytes long because it's five bytes for hello, five bytes for world, and three punctuation marks. So that's a total of 13. Uh, uh, but that's huge. That's not length. Pardon me. Hello world, 13 is carriage return, and 10 is line feed. That's what this is. So this will print hello world, carriage return, line feed, and then exit. So that program can be compiled, and then you can run it and it will print hello world. So uh, uh, up here, I think, is going to build it, and you'll eventually be able to run hello.exe. You'll see hello world here. There it is. So now you can write raw assembly, compile it on Windows, and run it. And so there's a few simple things to do here. You can examine. Now you created a file. We can now use our malware analysis tools to examine that file. So you can take a look at it, see what language it's written in here. And uh, then you can make a buffer overflow in assembly. So this is going to define a um, space to store data. This is going to be um, 
only law enough, what is your name? Hello, hello. And then uh, this is the buffer, which has only room for name. And then you can put in too much. So when you compile this thing and run it, you can put in a short name like five letters. But when you put in a longer name, the data leaks out of the first variable into the second variable. So it doesn't cause a crash, but it causes one variable to leak into the next variable, which is the simplest kind of buffer overflow. We have two strings, and the first one leaks into the next one. And so again, you can examine it with some of these malware analysis tools and see it going. So it's very simple assembly code, but it gets you started. And so next time, we're going to talk about IDA Pro. I'm not going to demonstrate this yet, because IDA Pro needs some introduction. But that's where we're headed. And uh, so here we are on, eight, on September 3rd. So you should have started doing quizzes and projects. You should have your basic virtual machine running. And you should start doing uh, the static analysis and move ahead. Um, and, but nothing will be treated as late until 917 because people might still be adding. So are there any questions about it? One thing uh, some people have emailed me about is they're using the VirtualBox machine and it won't start. If that happens, often a restart will fix it. If that doesn't fix it, go into the disks and delete the small disk. There's a 100 megabyte extra disk in that one. If you delete that, it'll boot from the other one. If it won't start, it's trying to boot from the wrong disk. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. When the virtual machine I tried using just today, it said uh, you won't downgrade. <clears throat> you're, I think your link is uh, player number 12, red 12, and the machine I was working on already had 15. Oh, yeah. If I would not downgrade to an old version of VMware player. Um, if, if you're using Windows, you've got to use the latest version because the old versions don't work well on, modern, on Windows 10. Okay, so I, I would not downgrade. I would use. Oh, yeah, I would use the latest version of, on Windows especially, use the latest version of VMware Player, or you'll probably end up with a machine that is shrunk down and you can't see anything. That's a huge problem on Windows. The simplest answer is just use a Mac. But if you want to use Windows, um, it is possible, although very painful, to use VMs on Windows these days, um, that the best thing is to use the very latest version of VMware Player. Yeah, yeah and I can help you. Uh, that's why I was, that motivated me to move to the cloud. For the last year, running VMs on Windows has been almost impossible. The only thing that works is to have an old Windows machine or um, to be very good at doing all these fancy tricks. Because ever since Windows moved to high resolution, VMware hasn't worked hardly at all. And the, it's working a little better if you get the very latest version, but it's very painful. Anyway. I have yeah. the 14 and it's been working, but maybe I did have an issue the other day. And I think maybe it's yeah, I was, it depends on your graphics card and everything, and it depends on the updates. Even when you get it working, Microsoft will keep breaking it every month with the forced updates. That's why the only students that ever had success in the last year have been ones that did something like stop Windows updates, freeze their machine about a year old, and then pick and choose and get a specific version of VMware Player that worked on that particular machine. It is very frustrating. This is what motivated me strongly to move everything possible to the cloud. Within the next time, my next semester, I'm hoping to have everything in the cloud and never use these local virtualization ever again because they just don't work at all. But if you want to not go nuts, work on a Mac. That's my recommendation. However, if you are cool with Windows, you might be able to make it work on a Windows machine. You'll spend a lot of time debugging. Um, yeah. Similar to this question, um, I have Ubuntu really recommend that. Ubuntu should work fine. It's a Windows problem. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, to work, Ubuntu would be almost as good as a Mac. You should be able to run VirtualBox on that, or for that matter, VMware on that, and it should be fine. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, then, yeah. Um, this, the seven zip of malware keep away. Um, that didn't come down because it said uh, it's too big or something. Seven zip is too big. Yeah. Malware. No, well, see, let me in, in this. Yeah, the machine we're using. Let me bring up this first project because if you can't get the machine working, you're going to have no fun at all. So this is the most important project. First, get some kind of virtualization and then use one of these. Most people just use VMware, VMware Player on a Windows or VMware Fusion on a Mac, and then you download this thing. It's two gigs. So I mean, it'll be too slow to download if you have slow internet at home, but you can certainly download it in the lab. And then you have to unzip it with 7-zip or on the Mac with the unarchiver. I'll show you in the lab. Yeah, show me in the lab. I can help you do it. Let's see if anybody else has questions. All right. I'm using VM Workstation Pro, and it works fine on Windows. All students have free access for a year. Yes, uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, some people are successful with VMware. Just It does not work as well as you think. I know from teaching a class, many, many students are 
suffer greatly. But sometimes it works, and if it does, count your blessings and enjoy it. Um, and the very latest version of it works a little better than the previous ones, but Microsoft still vigorously breaks it every month. It is, um, as, as far as I can tell, Windows 10 is unsuited for any use these days, but some people still love it. But you, it's constantly being broken under you. Microsoft's updates are terrible. Anyway, uh, can this be used to edit code? Um, you're talking about Jasmine? Oh, you're talking about Masm or Jasmine? Masm, I don't think you can use it to edit code. Um, if you want to edit code, you've got to use a debugger like Ollie Debug, which we're going to use later. All right. Yeah, Jasmine, I don't think you can edit code in Jasmine because it doesn't actually go to the binary assembly code. It goes from real assembly code. And all it does is save it as a plain text file. It doesn't really create Windows executables. It just lets you play with assembler itself. So it really is not a real compiler or anything. It's just a simulator to practice assembly. You've got to use MASM32 if you want to write assembly. And if you want to modify compiled code, you've got to use a debugger like um, Ollie or Unity. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there anything in physics to suggest that free will is anything other than an illusion? Uh, I, that's a deep question. And I would say, I would say that is arguably not even a physics question, but a metaphysics question whether humans have free will or not. There are people that attempt to test it, um, but it's certainly a very interesting question, very closely tied to quantum mechanics and the collapse of the wave function. And I think um, it's not much different than a guru or a, a religious leader. These are the fundamental questions of, of the world. I must say, I, my mother was an expert in metaphysics. And I asked her this question when I was a child and she gave me the only, was probably the best answer I've ever heard. She said, I said, well, how do I know this isn't all a dream? And she said, you don't. And I said, Mom, that, I wanted a better basis for my life than that. And she said, well, you might want it, but you won't get it. So look at it this way. Either the world, either you have free will, the world is there to do things, or nothing matters. Now, if it's the second one, there's no point living. So the first one is more fun, so go with that. And I said, that's the basis of my existence? And she said, yep, that's it. Get over being so upset about it. And I think that is it. That's right. That seems like the best answer I ever came across. But anyway. Um, there is like two theories that either everything is designed. Yes. Or just some chance. Yes. This was Einstein's issue. Is there real randomness or is there just a hidden order that you can't see? That's the hidden variable theory. Uh, the evidence seems to very strongly suggest that there is real randomness. But free will is a similar but different question. Do we actually have any control? Or are we just being moving along like cannonballs by momentum to some inescapable conclusion? And it's very hard to know. If free will could be an illusion. How would we ever know? This is closely related to the one that's popular these days. Are we living in a simulation? Is this just a movie, a Sims game on somebody's desktop? And again, how would we ever know? These are very tough questions, but they're not that different than questions like what was before the Big Bang? And is there a parallel universe? And people do try to find ways to detect that. And there may be some subtle clues in like the three degree background radiation to rule out some of these hypotheses. They're not just completely science fiction like you think. There might be some defect in the simulation or something that we could detect by looking carefully enough. It's um, People are exploring these things and it's almost religion, but it, you could also think of it as deep science or physics. Yeah. Well, in a way, it's kind of nuts, but in a way, it's, it's no more nuts than asking, like, how far away are the stars, how big is the universe? They don't ask questions, you know, they don't No, of course not. But humans do. It's not that different than, say, number theory, proving things about prime numbers. It's something some people like to do, and other people say, this is nuts, it's useless, and maybe it is. It, but it's not that different than ballet. People do this, and they say, this is great, and other people say, you're wasting your time, you know? It's, anyway, I'm going to stop the share. These are interesting questions, though. I'm all for it. And we have control over our reactions. Ignacio, that is what, that is the question. We either have control over our reactions, but maybe we only have the illusion of having control. That's what's really painful. You can't ever go back and do it over the other way. So you don't know. This could just be a movie that progressing along an inevitable track, and we would never know. I disagree with that. Well, I do too, because it offends me. I have this feeling that I have accomplished things through making effort, and I deserve credit for that, but I certainly can't prove it. It could just be a movie playing, and I don't know it. It's, anyway, I'm going to turn off the share. I'll put this video up. It's not a waste of time to worry about these things at all. It's, uh, I don't think it is at all. I think.
there's a time for these things. It's like deciding whether to be a good person or not, and is there any God and all this stuff. This is important stuff. But you struggle, and you usually don't reach a firm answer on these things. What happens is through life, you move from one position to another, I think. I think it's like that one, an old, there's a football player, baseball player, some athlete trying to prove the world's flat. You know? Yeah, yeah. There are a few people that try to do something like prove the world is flat, which is really pretty foolish when you do something where it's pretty easy to prove you're wrong. But a lot of these other questions, it's not easy to prove you're wrong. And so I don't think it's useless to study. But it certainly is not reasonable to expect to resolve it anytime soon. But the struggle might teach you something. Anyway, I'll stop this for now. The price is okay.